So, so on that theme, it, it's now time to focus on the reinvent part of our agenda uh, as we cast our mind to the future. Um, I am delighted, we're just getting some Zoom going on there. I'm delighted to introduce our, our speaker for this session, Shara Evans. Shara is a technologist, futurist and keynote speaker. She's recognized as one of the world's top female futurists, fusing her engineering background with an intuitive understanding of how society is likely to respond to new technologies. She's the founder and CEO of Market Clarity, an award-winning technology analyst firm and a regular media commentator on technology issues. She appears on a number of TV shows here in Australia, Sky News, the ABC, uh, and other Australian commercial channels. She's also appearing on Fox and CW Network's New Life 2.0 Science documentary series in the USA, and was recently named by Forbes as one of the world's top 50 female futurists. Shara will be speaking for the next 50 minutes or so, and we hope to have some time for Q&A at the end. So uh, we appreciate if you uh, would submit your questions via the chat function. Otherwise, uh, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Shara. Thank you, Chris, and welcome everybody. It is an absolute delight to be with the OMERS team today. Hello to everybody in Australia, Singapore, Toronto, and those of you who may be tuning in from other parts of the world. Today, we're gonna have a bit of fun. I'm a futurist, as Chris said, and I'm going to be taking you on a ride into the future, focusing from the near term, where we're at right now, over the next 10 years, and then going out to 50 years and beyond. So let's go on a bit of a ride. Now, I'm used to being in front of live audiences, you know, big crowds of people where I can ask questions and get people to raise hands and get feedback and audience interaction and let everybody see what their colleagues are thinking. Well, in a virtual world, it's a little bit hard to do that. So what I'd like to ask you to do is if I ask you a question, type into the Q&A box your answer so that the rest of your colleagues around the world can see what the people in your team are thinking about a particular topic. Let's have a little bit of fun together and make this really interactive. So, we need to start with the here and now, and boy, are we on one heck of a Corona coaster ride. And unlike this roller coaster where people are screaming out of joy, this is a scream of, oh my God, when are we going to get out of this? Is it ever going to end? Will lockdowns ever end? Well, luckily here in Australia, We've got some good news. Borders are starting to open up between New South Wales, Victoria, and Queensland next week. Yay! But will we see international travel anytime soon? Well, I don't think that that's on the cards. And, you know, we heard a little while ago from some of your colleagues in Canada, and I was looking at the news earlier today, and I was looking at the COVID cases going up. Not good. My family is primarily in America and they're having a virtual Thanksgiving dinner right now. And of course, I'm not part of it because I'm here in Australia, but it is a really scary situation and we just don't know exactly when it's going to end. The good news is that there are some vaccines on the horizon that may help out, but these have been brought to market very, very quickly and Whenever you get something that's brand new, you sometimes have some unexpected results. And with the vaccines that look like they may be available in America within the next couple of weeks or the end of the year, what they're saying is that you're gonna need two jabs. And in looking at the news this morning, the American Medical Association was saying, people need to be aware that when they get that first jab and the second jab, they're actually gonna get what seems like a mild case of coronavirus and get some fevers and chills and even really bad headaches. And they're concerned that people may not take that second jab. So it's really important to understand that there are some ramifications to the vaccines that we're developing. But boy, talk about changing our world. This pandemic has brought to light just how precious life is and how quickly what we take for granted can change. And in fact, on the technology side, what I can say as a technologist 
is that I have seen changes that were thought to have occurred in the next five years happen over a five to nine month period. It's amazing how quickly things have changed. One of the areas where there has been tremendous change has been in working from home. And it's been an absolute necessity. You know, the world is practically shut down as it is. If we weren't able to work from home, we wouldn't really be able to do much at all. And with this virus, it's really tricky because it could come back and forth and back and forth over a period of years. And in fact, if I talk to some of my fellow futurists, you know, best case scenario for some semblance of normality would be 2023, but it could go all the way out to 2030. So we need to be prepared to be able to come in and out of lockdowns and in and out of remote working from home. And in fact, I think remote working from home is going to be a way of life. So initially, we sort of had to rush into it. But as we go into this more on the longer term basis, one of the things we need to think about is equipping our staff members with the right tools to be safe and productive. So rather than working just from small laptops, which may be family computers, we need to think about dedicated company computers that have the right kind of firewalls and antivirus and VPN software. We need to have IT teams that are able to check out that routers and things in people's homes are configured correctly. We need to have ergonomic furniture. We'll probably need to see companies deploying, for some people at least, big monitors so that they are more productive. And of course, all of this takes up space in someone's home. And we may see that companies have to pay or are going to step up and pay a stop end to people who are using their home space to use for work. And as we start returning into office buildings, which right now are primarily deserted, we're probably going to see a staggered return where a small group of people in a function, let's say IT, might come back first and then another function might come back with just a few people to try to contain it in case we see some sort of outbreak. But this is going to go on and off, in my view, for quite a few years. And remote work is definitely going to be part of our future. And this is not going to the next slide. Um, let's see. Okay. Don't you just love technology? It always happens with the technology futurists that something with technology decides to play out. One of the technologies that is becoming increasingly important in the current situation is virtual reality. And that's where you're completely immersed in a digital world. And you could use augmented reality too, where you literally can have superimposed on the real world an image of a digital world. But when it comes to things like buying property, whether it's residential property or commercial property, it doesn't really make a difference. We're starting to see this new trend of using 360 degree cameras to be able to film things in really high definition quality so that people have the confidence to buy or rent property without having actually seen it in person. And this is not working. And neither is, oops, yes, okay. Now, another thing that we are seeing is in my view, a move back to onshoring. So here in Australia, there have been products that I know I buy on a regular basis, or at least used to buy on a regular basis that have been out of stock long-term. And that's true all over the world for many different types of products. So we need to start thinking about how can we bring manufacturing back on shore because quite frankly, we do not know how long this current pandemic is going to last. And when it comes to bringing things back on shore, there are some new technologies like 3D printing that we can bring into the process. So it's not necessarily opening a traditional manufacturing plant. We may be doing things like 3D printing using metal or we may even be doing 3D printing of entire homes using the refuse from construction sites. It's crazy. OK, 
Okay, I'm going to need help. Okay. Another area that is getting a lot of attention is sustainability. And if anything, the pandemic has really brought to fore the fact that we're fragile as a human society and that unexpected things can happen and that we need to start taking climate change very seriously. Now, today, when it comes to renewable energies, the primary energies that you would most likely be thinking of are solar power and wind power. But of course, with solar, you would only get that during a sunny day. Oops, we've gone a little bit too far. And with wind, of course, you need wind. So one of the new technologies is, oh gosh, we're going, this is going out of control here with the slides, okay. One of the new technologies that is being implemented right now, including here in Australia, is something called green hydrogen. So with green hydrogen, we're using solar and wind to literally split out water into hydrogen and oxygen in a way that doesn't present any refuse and is environmentally friendly. And not only that, but this hydrogen can be used to fuel electricity grids. It can be stored in batteries. It can even be used in hydrogen powered vehicles that are starting to be designed. It's quite fascinating. There's another aspect too, is that you can take green hydrogen and use it to make green ammonia. So ammonia is an issue when it comes to carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide, rather emissions, which of course contribute to climate change. And by using green hydrogen and splitting off nitrogen from air, you can create an industrial fertilizer that's green and renewable. One of the energies that I'm super excited about, and this is fairly new, and I wonder how many of you have heard of this, is something called blue energy. Just type in if you've heard of blue energy. Blue energy is literally taking the kinetic force of when freshwater bodies like a river meet saltwater ocean. So any place that has a big coastline, Australia is one of them, Singapore is another one. There are lots of places around the world where you've got big coastlines and you've got rivers running into it. You get kinetic energy when you get the fresh water meeting the salt water. And what you do is you use these nanopore membranes. There's a couple of different techniques, but this is the one that I think is gonna be most effective to capture that kinetic energy and then feed it into hydroelectric plants. And the output from this, the only waste product is slightly brackish water. And brackish water means just slightly salty water. So it's environmentally friendly. This is an energy source that's 24 by seven and is available anywhere in the world. And it's starting to get a lot of attention right now. And there was one more thing that I wanted to say about hydrogen and there's a big um, green hydrogen plant that's being constructed in the Air Peninsula in South Australia. And just two days ago, my um, MP, local minister of parliament, sent an email message to me saying that he has just secured $50 million worth of government funding to invest in blue hydrogen or green hydrogen rather for New South Wales as well, which is super exciting. It hasn't passed all the way through both houses, but it looks like it's really promising. So another thing to think about are smart cities. We're seeing an acceleration towards smart city trends that were already underway because of COVID. And here we're talking about the internet of things, putting sensors everywhere, contact tracing, facial recognition, smart buildings, smart mobility, the rollout of technologies like 5G. But that's just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to smart cities. As we move further into the future, 
one of the ideas that scientists are already thinking about is a self-healing city using fleets of tiny little robots. There's actually a project that is coming out of Leeds in the UK that I've been tracking since about 2016, and I've actually had the privilege of speaking to one of the chief scientists in charge of this project, where they're designing all these little robots that will be able to detect defects in city infrastructure and have robots literally autonomously go out and repair them before a defect becomes a big problem. So for example, imagine a pothole. How many of you have ever run into a pothole and done damage to your car? Probably most of us. Imagine that you have driverless cars going all along these smart cities and they've got image cameras and they can see where there's a pothole in the making and you, know, you use this data and you send it to a little robot and it goes out and starts patching it right as the pothole is starting before it forms anything that is dangerous to a car or a pedestrian or anyone else. Well, because this is still in the experimental stage and we don't have driverless cars all over the place, the scientists have designed three robots to look at this specifically as part of this experiment. And one of them flies around and starts looking at the roads and looking for potholes in the making. Then another one has um, detection where it's able to start, you know, putting robots out and 3D printing with asphalt to fill it in. It's a series of robotic drones that literally are able to go out and fix these things. So by the year 2050, we might actually see self-repairing cities. Now, this sounds like science fiction. Well, if you think it's sci-fi, let me tell you, today, it's already science fact. On the Sydney Harbour Bridge, for the last eight years, there have been autonomous robots that were designed by UTS and the New South Wales Roads and Maritime Service that literally are working to keep the steel girders on the bridge well maintained. They autonomously map out the area that they're traveling through. They're based on an inchworm type of robot. So they sort of inch along and they send pictures back to the bridge engineers and who then can determine whether maintenance is required. And we have two robots on the bridge today, Sandy and Rosie, that are out there doing maintenance on the bridge. And this is real life today. When it comes to driverless cars, I think it's gonna be a while before we start to see them really out in force. In fact, before it becomes mainstream, we're gonna need something like a 30% penetration. But as I go out into the future, and I think about what this actually is going to mean, think about a 10 year time frame. Right now, the driverless cars still require human intervention in a lot of cases. But what we will see in the future is full autonomy and the sensors will talk not only to the people in the car, but they'll communicate with each other vehicle to vehicle through a cloud-based network. They'll communicate with traffic infrastructure. So a traffic light will say, I'm green and I'm staying green for another 10 minutes or 10 seconds rather, or you're in a speed zone that is 50 kilometers per hour and your car will automatically go whatever the speed limit happens to be. Think about the ripple effects. First of all, say goodbye to traffic infringement revenue when we start getting a lot of vehicles that are out there. But think about the jobs it's going to create too because somebody's got to put these Internet of Things sensors across all the traffic infrastructure. And this is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to what will change with driverless cars. There's another new transport technology that's on the horizon that's super exciting and it's Hyperloops. How many of you have heard of Hyperloops? Just type into the Q&A box. It's a vacuum, if you like, you know, so a tube that has the air sucked out of it so that it's almost like being in outer space where a pod gets hurtled through it at super fast speed. Just a few weeks ago, one of the companies that is building Hyperloop, Virgin Hyperloop, did a test with human passengers on their 500 meter test track that's located in Nevada. 
and they had their chief technology officer and co-founder, as well as the head of customer experience as the two human guinea pigs that actually went on this test drive. It went at about 175 kilometers per hour, and it was successful. There are a number of commercial companies that are looking at deploying Hyperloops, including here in Australia. So obviously there's Virgin Hyperloop, there's Hyperloop Transport Technologies, and there's also um, the Boring Company, which is one of Elon Musk's companies. But imagine what this would mean, say, if you lived in Sydney and you were going to Newcastle, which normally would take about two hours to drive, what if you could get there in 10 minutes? That would make such a big difference to a country the size of Australia in terms of where you could live and work and where you might locate your headquarters. And there are countries all around the world that are looking at Hyperloop solutions. If I had to pick just one technology that was going to have the biggest impact on humanity and business over the next decade, it would be artificial intelligence. And when I talk about AI, I'm using it as an umbrella term to include techniques like deep learning and machine learning, but it also includes things like smart digital assistants and chatbots and natural language detection, you know, whether it be voice or text-based, emotion detection, smart robots, driverless cars, you name it. Add into the mix big data, which is the fuel that these AIs use to learn from, and advances in quantum computing, where computing power, if experiments pan out, could be accelerated greatly. Imagine a laptop that has the power of an array of supercomputers that you're carrying around with you in five or 10 years time. That's the promise of quantum computing. I won't go into a lot of detail, but boy, it could have a major impact. One of the things that we're seeing with AI, and it's being deployed widely in a lot of different industry, are chatbots. And one that's really cute is called Wobot, and it's designed to help people who are feeling depressed. And of course, with everything that's happening in the world, who isn't feeling a little bit depressed? It was designed by researchers at Stanford University. It's an app that's text-based, and literally it's doing cognitive behavior therapy. It's called Wobot, and you can download it for free from the Google um, Play Store or the Apple App Store. It's an example of a text-based chatbot. But really, when it comes to AI, the next big thing is going to be voice-based chatbots, voice-based digital assistants. Your kids and grandkids are going to expect to walk up to any object and be able to talk to it. I'd like to share a funny story with you, and some of you will relate. How many of you have devices at home like um, an Alexa or maybe Google Home, you know, just type your answers in, you know, let's get a sense of who has what. In the UK, there's an African gray parrot called Rocco that is a fantastic mimic. It's one of the qualities of these types of African gray parrots, and it mimics its owner's voice to a T. And it found that it can use its owner's Amazon Alexa to order treats for itself. So it every day orders things like watermelon and ice cream and you name it. And it sounds just like its owner. <laughs> so every day his owner comes home and has to check what's on the shopping list and do a cancellation. Can you imagine if you had a whole bunch of smart birds talking to Alexa, how that would skew an AI database? That would be pretty funny. But this bird, it's clever. It loves to rock out as well. It tells Alexa, it just chats back and forth with Alexa all day long and tells it what kind of music to play. So the owner comes home and the bird's typically dancing on top of Alexa. But these devices may get even more intimate as we move into the future. In the Imperial Business School in London, they were predicting a few years ago, it hasn't happened yet, but that these devices would start to analyze the conversations that people have in a household and start interjecting with personal relationship advice, like, oh, you know, Joe, you shouldn't talk to your wife like that. You know, that's man speak. You know, if you want to get through to a lady, this is how you should phrase it. 
Can you imagine getting advice from your home digital assistant or even business advice you know, in a business context? It could get pretty wild and crazy. Another thing that's an important aspect of artificial intelligence is emotion detection. And it could be from the expressions on our face. It could be from the words that we use or the cadence of the words that we use or the text that we type. Um, obviously, there's facial recognition, but if you're wearing a mask, you're not going to have facial recognition work too well. So I'm going to just leave that off to the side for right now. Look at this picture of this young man. How many of you could pick out every single emotion he's expressing? I know I couldn't. And I've asked this question at lots of conferences where I can see people raise their hands. And I've never had a conference where anybody raised their hand and said, oh, I can pick out every single emotion. From a company perspective, imagine if you had these AI tools that you're using that are able to pick out the emotional signals from either your clients or in a call center and use it as a trigger to get a human in the loop or figure out if somebody is exhibiting signs of distress and gets a person who is specifically trained to help in those situations involved and take over the call. This can be a hugely, hugely beneficial aspect of AI. And in fact, I'm predicting that one of the new jobs of the future is going to be an empathy trainer and that these people who are empathy trainers are not going to necessarily be, you know, computer scientists and AI specialists. They'll work with them for sure, but they're much more likely to be philosophers, playwrights, and people with a social science background that start helping to train AI through reinforcement learning to better mimic how an empathetic human would treat somebody. Now, with every technology, there's always good and bad, yin and yang. And when it comes to image detection, unfortunately with AI, and it has to do with the underlying mathematical linear function, it's not a flaw in AI, all you have to do is jiggle less than 1% of pixels in an image, and you can trick an AI into thinking that an image that looks to a human as one thing is something completely different. So in this picture, researchers tricked an AI into thinking that a school bus was an ostrich, that a pyramid was an ostrich, that a little doggy was an ostrich, all by just jiggling less than 1% of the pixels. So you can imagine what kind of nefarious things could happen if someone had access to an image database. And it gets even weird, more weird and wonderful when you get into this world of deep fakes. So in case you haven't heard of that term, it's an AI technique that allows you to take a video of a person and superimpose another person's image and voice on top of that other person. So imagine this scenario. You're involved in a merger and acquisition discussion, and you think that you're talking to one of your colleagues because it looks like them, it sounds like them, it has the background of their home or their office in back of them, and you've got no idea that it's actually a hacker who's hacked into some sort of video conferencing system, maybe for the first time ever. So it's not something you should be even on your radar. And they're asking you questions that they would, the person that you would normally talk to would ask about a particular merger or acquisition. And you disclose sensitive information that would normally require stock market disclosure. So who would be responsible? Would it be the person who has been tricked? Would it be the video conferencing company? Would it be the cyber criminal or someone else? This is on the near term horizon. It has not happened as a hack yet, but certainly deep fakes are real. When it comes to AI, there are a lot of things that we need to think about as we start deploying this more and more into our society. And one of them has to do with what I would call reinforcement learning or training the AI to be a good citizen. And I'll tell you a funny story. There's an AI from the OpenAI lab that they were training to play on 
a boat racing game called Coast Runners. And the objective of the game is to cross the finish line with as many points as you could get. And you get points when these green widgets pop up and then you run over the widget and you collect points. Well, the AI got super competitive and decided that it was going to focus on getting as many points as possible, running around in circles, crashing into other boats, crashing into walls, but never finishing across the line. And the researchers determined we need to put hooks into this so that as we're feeding these AIs through our deep learning databases, we've got the ability to start teaching it what's right and what's wrong. And that starts to get into this whole area of ethics as well, which is extremely important. In fact, right now, law, pretty much in every part of the world, is very much focused on humans making decisions, not machines making decisions. And as machines start making decisions, the law doesn't account for that at all. And there are going to be a lot of changes in our future because of this. Now, another aspect that's really fascinating when it comes to AI is robots. This is the physical instantiation of AI, and they're going to take lots of shapes and forms. We're already seeing humanoid robots being used for elder care, they're being used as concierges in retail and all sorts of places. But they take lots of shapes and sizes. It's not just humanoid. This is an example of a robot called a BioArgo that is being deployed in the Indian Ocean to look at the growth of plankton. And it's able to go two kilometers deep. It was designed by CSIRO, which is a scientific organization based here in Australia. And it goes two kilometers deep and then surfaces and sends data up to satellites. And it's able to cover an area 10 times the size of the continent of Australia, which is pretty big. So that's an example of a robot you may not have heard of. Another example out of Australia, but being deployed all around the world, are robots in agriculture. And these robots have all kinds of sensors fitted into them. And they're able to do things that humans simply cannot do because of the sensors that they have. So they can detect moisture levels in an area that they're trundling past. They can detect pests. They can detect fungus. They can detect whether there is a plant that is ready to be harvested. They can do things like help buds on a plant so that they can estimate crops. The list of things that can be done by putting sensors on top of robots, whether they're terrestrial based or drones flying above an agricultural area is incredible. If you take that and combine it with big databases on crop yields and weather patterns and so on, then you can start to see the power where you can take these machines and add it with these other databases, use artificial intelligence as well, even though the robots themselves use AI, and start to offer it as a package on a service basis. And in fact, I think as we start looking over the next decades, we're going to see robots as a service in lots of shapes and forms becoming one of the big service areas because robots are expensive, they still need to be programmed and trained, and a small farm owner is not going to be buying a fleet of custom purpose robots, nor will people in a lot of different industries that robots are designed to do very, very specific tasks. Health is another amazing area where we are seeing tremendous advances. And it's this combination of medical advances and technology smashed together that is creating some amazing opportunities for humanity. One of the areas that I really like is augmented reality. And many of you have probably heard of it, but what you may not have heard of is using augmented reality glasses to help people who are legally blind be able to see again. So this particular project started out of Oxford University and then became a startup and is now a full-fledged company called Oxite. The initial deployment of this technology involved rather clunky glasses that you can see in some of the pictures and this big backpack that you had to walk around with. But the person using it had macular degeneration and would not have been able to get around on their own without these augmented reality glasses. 
this is now at the stage where the picture that you can see on the bottom right allows a woman who is legally blind to be able to read sheet music. And this is all going more and more sophisticated. And you can actually buy these glasses and they'll have some new pairs in 2021. So this is today technology. Wow, isn't that amazing? It gets even crazier, though, as we start moving into the future. How many of you have heard of smart contacts? Well, I can't see your hands, but I'll assume some of you may have. In the big picture that I'm showing, this is from Google back in 2014. And you can see that there are a lot of electronic things in the way that would block your vision. The smaller picture shows a 2016 model that they came up with. Well, there are lots and lots of companies that are looking at smart contacts. And what's really interesting about this is that it's not just augmented reality. It's combining augmented reality with all kinds of ICT, the sort of things and apps that you'd find on your smartphone, plus biotech. And that's where it gets fascinating is the plus biotech. Now, a lot of this was stalled for a really long time, but it's in the last couple of months that I'm starting to see progress. A company called Mojo Vision has been in stealth mode for about five years, and they've literally come out with a prototype that looks very much like that um, second Google picture that I was talking about that they've demonstrated that allows people who have eye um, impairment issues to be able to zoom in and out and see things. Plus, they have an app that allows you to add augmented reality into the mix as well. And just recently, there was a magazine that's dedicated to optometry that started to talk about all of the different companies that are coming out with smart contacts with biotech capabilities. And I won't name all of them, but they're doing things like drug delivery through these smart contacts. They're doing things like being able to treat chemical burns to your eyes through using specialized bandages or specialized drugs that literally come right out of the smart contacts and into your eyes. They're also developing a number of techniques to determine whether you have a pre-glaucoma condition by measuring intraocular pressure. There's a lot more in development. And if you're interested in this, catch up with me on LinkedIn and ask me to send you a link to the article and I'd be happy to do that. But this is gonna be a big technology. You know, we're just starting to see the smatterings of it. Commercial, we're still a few years away from it, but it's finally coming to fruition. Another super, super exciting technology uses 3D printing, but it's called bioprinting because it's using biological material. In this case, human stem cells. So imagine if you have a heart and you need to have a heart transplant, you've got a problem and you're on a donor list and you don't know if your heart is gonna make it long enough to eventually get a transplant. What if you could harvest the stem cells from your body, have them grown in a bioreactor, it might take a month to grow a full-sized heart, and then literally have it grown to fit the exact shape and size of the heart that you need to replace using your own stem cells so that your body doesn't reject it. Well, we're starting to go down that path. The picture that I'm showing you here is of a scientist from Israel who published a paper last year showing how they had actually bioprinted a living miniature human heart using these exact principles of harvesting stem cells and then letting them grow. There's still a lot of work to be done. We're probably about 10 years away before we start bioprinting for real. But in a 10 year time frame, when you need an organ transplant or need a skin patch or something else, it's likely to be done by using the stem cells from your own body. 
even crazier still are tiny, tiny robots. You know, um, if you follow me at all, you'll know that I love talking about robots. Well, this is something that MIT came up with a number of years ago now, and still research lab stuff, but basically it's a pill that you swallow that has these little origami type robots that fold up. And it was designed to help people who've swallowed button batteries. And I don't know why, but people somehow manage to do this on a regular basis, you know, adults and kids. And unfortunately, the button battery can get lodged in your esophagus or your stomach. And trying to get it out through traditional surgery is really dangerous. Well, this little origami robot is able to be directed by a surgeon to exactly the spot where the button battery is lodged and then it unfurls and it literally flicks the button battery off of wherever it's lodged and injects an anti-inflammatory drug and then everything comes out through your digestive system. This is where the future of medicine is heading, but it's going to get even funnier and crazier and more exciting when we get to nanobots. Now, this is um, a picture that was released last year from a study done at the University of Pennsylvania. And these super tiny little nanorobots, and by the way, there's some that are a lot, lot smaller than this. They look like little bugs. They're made out of glass, but they have a silicon wafer on top. And with that, they've got solar cells that allow these four little legs that they have to move. In fact, it reminded me a bit of an ant. But I like this picture because it gives you an idea of how small this is in relation to a virus. Now, you know where I'm going to go with this, right? So the way that this particular one works is that to get the legs to move, you actually take a laser and you shine it on the solar panels on top of these little nanobots and it gets the legs to move and it moves around. Unfortunately, the laser can only penetrate about the width of a fingernail right now. So it's not really all that useful. But what's even more interesting is an experiment that was published in a paper about two years ago, a collaboration between one of the nanotech institutes in China and Arizona State University, where they took DNA rolled up that was targeted to a particular type of tumor and coated it with a protein that was able to detect a specific type of cancer tumor. And as soon as it detects it, it unfurls and injects a blood clotting drug, literally starving the tumor of blood supply and causing the cancer tumor to die. That's called precision medicine. So now take this principle and apply it to coronavirus, which of course is a teensy tiny little virus. Imagine having these little nanobots that have coatings that target coronavirus. And as soon as it finds coronavirus in your body, guess what? It just specifically attacks the coronavirus in your body. There are already researchers in Japan that are starting to look at this right now. Imagine if we put something like this on warp speed, we might actually wipe coronavirus off the face of the earth once and for all. Imagine what the future will hold with these little nanobots. So initially, these teeny tiny little robots will be targeted for specific medical conditions, but eventually, talking 20 year time frame, they're going to be out there in sitting in our body, looking around and scouting like detectives. Where's the defect? Is there anything wrong? Oh, I see something that needs repair. I'm going to go and fix it. And it will start to keep you healthy before anything has a chance to actually catch hold in your body and become a disease. But like anything else, what do you do if something goes wrong? Well, you're going to need a new job of the future called a nanomedic who's going to be able to go in and fix this kind of stuff as something goes amiss. And inevitably, as with any kind of new technology, things will likely go amiss and you would be calling your nanomedic for help. Going to the next one. And 
what is the future of health going to look like? And do we have the possibility of maybe even living forever? Well, nanobots are really exciting, but so is genetic engineering. And in fact, there have been experiments over the last number of years where geneticists have started to identify ways of reversing aging in human cells and in living mice with a disease called progeria, which is this rapid aging disease. And they've done it in a live mouse where it actually went younger again. So fast forward a little bit. Imagine that we have this technology where let's say we're in our 50s or 60s and we decide, you know what, I think I'd actually like to have my body back, you know, at 20, but keep, you know, all the wisdom that I have or whatever age you pick. And suddenly you can start reverse aging. Well, as if that isn't enough, what happens when we identify the gene pair that actually controls aging? This is where it's going to get really weird and wacky because there are scientists who believe that it's really just a matter of time before we do and that when that happens we will literally be able to live to anywhere between 400 and 800 years old so imagine this can you imagine working until you're 400 years old what about being married to the same person for 800 years well, I don't know about you, but my interests just in my lifetime have changed substantially. I can just imagine what I might be like 800 years from now. I might be married to someone I love dearly, but our interests may diverge wildly. It's going to have a huge impact on the planet's population if people live radically longer, but also on the whole fabric of society and on healthcare if we're able to achieve this. And early experiments show that it is likely genetic engineering is one of these cutting edge technologies that has so much potential, including curing very, very specific diseases. So going into the future, will we be taking technology into our bodies? Will we become cyborgs like this picture? Well, one of the things um, that we might be doing is taking brain implants into our head. And Again, that might sound like something pretty crazy, but it's been worked on in the scientific community for a lot of years. Most of the initial research was medical directed and aimed at people who have memory issues with diseases like Alzheimer's and dementia and others where they were trying to determine ways of storing memories so that people could access them even if they were starting to lose their cognitive capabilities. And there are a lot of researchers that are now looking well beyond these early medical stages into many other things. The most famous person who's looking at this is Elon Musk with his Neuralink company, but he's not the only one, not by far. There are lots of research labs that are looking at this. One of his initial focuses was saying, well, I think we need to get this AI sublayer in our brains that we can stave off, you know, the world of the machines and keep pace with AI. But then he backed off from that, went more into the medical side of things and started to look at developing chips, which he's developed prototypes for, to help people who have suffered spinal paralysis, where literally the complete spine cord nerve has been cut and enable them to start walking again. Well, that's pretty incredible. But some of the later experiments that he's been working on in Neuralink and other researchers too, have been on controlling emotions by looking at different hormones. So, you know, where does that leave us? You know, some third party controlling how our brains react? What happens when we take these chips into our head? Who actually owns the chip? And how does the chip that might be in our head determine the difference between an actual intention and a fleeting thought? So for example, if you were driving and somebody cut you off on the highway and it was a near miss and you got scared, you might have a fleeting thought, somebody should mirror in that so-and-so, but you had no intention of doing it. But what if the AI chip actually does it? Who's responsible, you or the chip? Again, you know, we get into this whole area of ethics. 
But where I'd like to close with, which is a really optimistic um, future of humanity, is space travel. And if that doesn't sound science fiction, I don't know what is. But it's starting to happen right now. And it's being driven by private industry. And it's because of the development of reusable rockets. And there are quite a few companies that are getting into this some big well-known ones, but a lot of startups too. And I suspect a lot of these startups will end up getting acquired by some of the big companies and other investors and so on. But we will eventually be colonizing other planets, not only in our solar system, but perhaps in the galaxy beyond. Because what We've determined, and this is real hardcore science, radio astronomy, you can look at the NASA website. They have determined there are at least 4,300 exoplanets in our galaxy, in the Milky Way, and there are millions of galaxies. Scientists estimate that there are about 300 million planets just in this galaxy that are capable of supporting human life. And not only that, but we've recently discovered that not only is there water on Mars in the polar caps, but it looks like that there's water that's been flowing from time to time as well. And just a few weeks ago, NASA's SOFIA mission published information about water being discovered on the sunlit part of the moon. And that bodes super well for us establishing habitats on other planets in our solar system and beyond. Now, when it comes to this sunlit water on the moon, they're not quite sure whether it was underneath the surface, whether it's meteorites that have deposited water, or whether it's even energetic particles coming from the sun. But if we're finding it on multiple bodies just in our solar system, the chance is really good that we will find water in other solar systems and on other exoplanets as well. And we may, in our lifetimes, and if not our lifetimes, our kids and our grandkids, start exploring the universe in our solar system and beyond. Thank you so very much. It's just been an absolute delight presenting to you today. And I'd like to invite you to connect with me on LinkedIn. And if you have questions, um, we've got some time for Q&A now. And happy to answer questions after the fact, you know, if you contact me on my website or through social media. Th thank you, Shara, for a very interesting and thought-provoking presentation. Um, we've only got a couple of minutes left, uh, so I thought I'd just uh, maybe have time for a couple of questions. First one was, you've obviously come across many interesting people in your research in this space, these people challenging the status quo and, and developing these technologies that will lead us into the future. Uh, are there any common traits that you point to with these people, particularly in respect of the thought process, thought processes they use, which potentially our team could also apply to anticipate these changes as we think about our business in the future? Well, the, the people that I find most interesting are out of the box thinkers. You know, they just do not accept the status quo as always being the way that it will be. And they are very often people who, like me, are science fiction geeks. I mean, I've got to admit it, you know, I've been reading science fiction actually since before I could read. I was probably looking at comic books that were science fiction. And that served as an inspiration for me. And if I think about many scientists, they've also taken their inspiration from the imagination of people who can imagine what it's like to live in a world that is just radically different than our own. A real concrete example that I'll give you is the Motorola StarTac phone. Do you remember that, Chris? You know, it was that flip phone, one yep. of the early mobile yep. phones? That was a direct ripoff, if you like, of the early first episodes of Star Trek where they had the communicators that were flip top. And that was inspired by science fiction. Arthur C. Clarke talked about satellites, and that literally started satellites. You know, so a whole bunch of things have been invented by people who have amazing imaginations. And I must say, a lot of science fiction writers are actually hardcore scientists as well. So they've got that real 
hardcore science and technology background, plus imagination. And that's the trait I'd look for, is that combination of real engineering or technology or physics knowledge plus imagination, then you've got a winner. Great, thank you. That's, that's fa fantastic. Thank you very much, Shara. I'm conscious of the time. I want to give um, a few people just a couple of minutes to refresh before we move to our other activities. So um, I'd like to thank you very much for your time and your insight, Shara. As you said, um, people can also get, on, get contacted with you online and, and dive into these topics more. Um, and so we'd encourage people to do that. Uh, but right now, um, I'd like to just ask everyone uh, to take this time to log off this WebEx and use the Zoom link in the second calendar invitation you've received. Um, if you could do that quickly, grab a drink, um, any other break, and um, be back as quick as you can so we can kick off the next event and uh, next activity on the hour. So thank you very much, Shara, and um, thank you, everyone else. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, everybody.